Hi, Mattes from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to this video, which marks the beginning of a new series on rigid body simulation. In this tutorial, we're starting from square one. I will guide you through writing your own rigid body simulation from scratch using JavaScript that you can run right in your browser. This lesson sets the stage for the various aspects of rigid body simulation we will cover in future videos. Whether you're a curious beginner or a seasoned developer, this journey will be both educational and fun. Stay tuned for upcoming videos in this series where we'll delve deeper into the various facets of rigid body simulation. For now, let's focus on mastering the basics. Here you see the JavaScript rigid body engine in action. This simulation of a crib mobile shows two basic features we will discuss today. The simulation of unconstrained rigid body motion and handling distance constraints. These constraints restrict the motion of pairs of bodies by maintaining the distance between two arbitrary points on the surface of the bodies. We use the constraints to link the bars and the spheres and for grabbing bodies with the mouse. I will put a direct link to this demo and a link to all the demos and slides of the channel in the description. Now, while our implementation is perfect for learning and experimentation, I want to give a quick shout out to two professional grade solutions. If you're working on a serious project, check out NVIDIA simulation engines, which also support rigid bodies and are fully GPU accelerated. There is PhysX for C++ projects and Warp for Python users. These are powerful tools that can take your simulations to the next level. Warp supports collision handling between complex shapes, inverse kinematics, the simulation of gyroscopic effects, differential simulation for optimization, rigid and soft body interaction, height field fluids, Eulerian fluids, and SPH simulations. PhysX allows the simulation of complex structures. It is used in real-time applications and games, but also for robotic simulations and digital twins. So now let's start with the first tutorial on rigid body simulation. If you search online for rigid body simulation techniques, you might encounter intimidating equations like these. Does this mean rigid body simulation is only for math wizards? Absolutely not. In the following slides, I'll introduce a much simpler and more intuitive method for simulating rigid bodies. My approach makes rigid body simulation accessible to a wider range of developers, designers and enthusiasts, not just mathematicians. We will employ position-based dynamics, an innovative method I introduced in tutorial number 9. This approach simplifies rigid body simulation, making it more accessible and intuitive. In addition, it is unconditionally stable, meaning it never blows up, even for infinite stiffnesses, which makes it well suited for interactive applications. In this tutorial, I will briefly recap the method. However, for a thorough understanding, I recommend watching tutorial number 9. For those less familiar with vector math, tutorial number 7 will equip you with the necessary background information. The traditional position-based dynamics method uses particles. Here you see the simulation loop in pseudocode. In every time step, we first perform an integration step. We run through all the particles. We add gravity times the time step size delta t to the velocity v. Next, we store the position x in a variable p. Then we add the velocity times the time step size to the position. This integration method is called semi-implicit Euler method. After integrating, we solve all the constraints. A good example is the distance constraint. It is used in cloth or soft body simulations. The distance constraint makes sure that the distance between pairs of particles equals the rest distance. After solving all the constraints, the velocities of the particles are updated. The new velocity is set to the position after the solve minus the position before the solve divided by delta t. In position-based dynamics, we solve a constraint by computing correction vectors delta x for all the particles participating in a constraint. These correction vectors are then immediately added to the particle positions after each constraint is solved. Position-based dynamics manipulates particle positions directly, contrasting with traditional methods that work with velocities or forces. This direct manipulation of positions gives the method its name and contributes to its intuitive nature and stability. Let us have a look at the special case of a distance constraint. Here we have two particles with position x1 and x2 and masses m1 and m2. We use the letter w for the inverse mass 1 over m. 
L0 is the rest or target length of the constraint and L its current length. Our goal is to move the particles such that the distance constraint is satisfied. In this case, we have to move them closer together. To get the physics right, we need to split the correction according to the inverse masses of the particles. Using inverse masses also provides a simple way to handle attachments to fixed objects by simply setting their inverse mass to zero. In this case, the fixed attachment point won't move at all. Here you see the formulas for the two correction vectors. They are quite simple. The vector x2 minus x1 divided by its length is a normalized vector pointing from particle 1 to particle 2. Multiplying it with the difference L minus L0 creates a correction vector which enforces the distance between the particles to be L0. This vector is then distributed between the particles proportional to their inverse masses. Transitioning from particle simulation to rigid body simulation is relatively straightforward. A key advantage is that the rigid body center of mass behaves exactly like a particle with position x, velocity v and mass m. This similarity allows us to reuse the same code we developed for particles. In addition to position and linear velocity, a rigid body possesses three key properties. An orientation q, an angle of velocity omega and the moment of inertia i. Let's examine each of these quantities individually. We define a local frame for each body. The local frame has its origin at the center of mass of the body and the axes are aligned with the principal axis of the body. The global pose of a rigid body is described by a position x and an orientation q. It defines how a point a in the local frame is transformed to a point a prime in the global coordinate frame. These are the equations to go from the local to the global frame and vice versa. In these equations, q is a quaternion and the star is the operation that rotates a vector using the quaternion. Fortunately, you don't have to know the math of quaternions because virtually all simulation frameworks provide a quaternion class. We use 3.js as in many previous tutorials. Here's my implementation. In the constructor of the rigid body class, I define a member variable rot of the type quaternion and its inverse. The rigid body provides two methods, one to go from local to global coordinates and one to go from global back to local coordinates. As you can see, their implementations are quite simple and straightforward. In addition to the velocity of the center of mass, a rigid body has an angular velocity, omega, which is a 3D vector passing through the center of mass. Its length defines the speed of the rotation in angles per second. Its direction describes the axis of rotation. The velocity of a point on the body can now be computed as omega cross r. If the body is in motion, we have to add the velocity v of the center of mass as well. The third additional quantity is the moment of inertia. We have used Newton's second law, f equals ma, many times before. We use this equation to simulate the center of mass of the body. Solving for a shows that the mass describes the resistance of the body to force. For larger masses, it takes a stronger force to cause the same acceleration. There's a rotational version of Newton's second law as well. Tau equals i times alpha. Tau is a torque, which is an angular force r cross f, where r is the offset to the center of mass of the point where the force is applied. Applying a torque causes an angular acceleration alpha. Solving for the angular acceleration shows that the moment of inertia describes the resistance of a body to torque. For a larger moment of inertia, it takes a larger torque to cause the same angular acceleration. In three dimensions, the resistance to a torque can vary in different directions. Here we have a cylinder whose height is larger than its diameter. Here the resistance to a torque that is applied perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder is larger than the resistance to a torque applied along the axis of the cylinder. Therefore, we represent the moment of inertia by a 3 by 3 matrix. In a general pose of a rigid body, all the elements of this matrix are non-zero in general. If we align the body with its principal dimensions, the tensor becomes diagonal and we can store it in a three-dimensional vector. This is what I do in my code. Then, whenever the inertia tensor is present in an equation, I transform all the quantities involved into the local frame of the body and perform the calculations there. You can find the inertia tensor for various basic shapes on Wikipedia. I will create another tutorial on how to compute the inertia tensor and other physical quantities for arbitrary triangle meshes. Now let's have a look at how we can extend the position-based dynamics algorithm to handle rigid bodies. In addition to handling the linear quantities x and v, we must now also handle the rotational quantities omega and q. We need to integrate them in time and update them after solving the constraints.
A constraint can now affect both the position and the orientation of the bodies. Therefore, we compute the updates delta x and delta q for all bodies participating in the constraint. Then we apply them to the position x and the orientation q. Here you see the extended integration step. We integrate the position and velocity of the center of mass exactly as we integrated the position and velocity of particles. In orange, you see how the orientation and angular velocities are updated. As for the position, we store the orientation before the solve. Next, we apply an external torque to the angular velocity if necessary. Finally, we update the orientation using the angular velocity. The JavaScript code on the right shows that the integration step is quite easy to implement. I won't derive any of those equations in this tutorial. Maybe I will create a future tutorial just about the mathematical derivations. The update of the angular velocity after the solve is quite easy to implement as well. We first compute the transformation delta q that transforms the body from the frame before the solve into the frame after the solve. Then we turn this transformation into an angular velocity. I will now show you how to generalize a distance constraint to constrain the distance between two arbitrary points on two bodies. Let us first recap the distance constraint between two particles. The constraint forces the distance between the particles to be L0. Here the current distance L is larger than L0. Therefore, we move the particles towards each other. We split the correction proportional to their inverse masses. For two rigid bodies, we specify the two attachment points relative to the center of mass by two vectors r1 and r2. To solve the constraint, we need r1 and r2 to be in the global frame. Because we typically want the points to stay in the same location of the body, we store r1 and r2 in the local frame of the bodies. Then, to solve the constraint, we rotate them back into the global frame using the body's current transformations. In our example, the current distance between the attachment points is again larger than L0. Therefore, we pull the attachment points toward each other. Doing this not only pulls the centers of mass closer together, it also causes rotations of the bodies as shown in orange. The rotations are distributed proportional to the inverse moments of inertia. I will now show you how to compute the position and the orientation updates. We are given the two vectors r1 and r2 in global space. In addition, we have a constraint direction n and a constraint distance c. The following equations are general and can be used for other constraints, as a collision constraint, for instance. In the case of a distance constraint, n is the normalized vector from a1 to a2 and c l minus l0. First, we compute a generalized inverse mass wi for each body. Now we compute the scalar value lambda, which is called the Lagrange multiplier of the constraint. Here alpha is compliance, which is the inverse of physical stiffness. Having lambda, we can now update the positions and orientations of the two bodies. In position-based dynamics, we do not work with forces. However, in certain situations, we might be interested in the force acting on the constraint. Fortunately, it is straightforward to compute this force as lambda times n divided by delta t squared. This is a good point to explain the difference between position-based dynamics PBD and the extended version XPBD. Both are unconditionally stable, which means they never blow up. The difference is subtle. It is a simple modification of the formula to compute lambda. The two methods differ in how to handle soft constraints. PBD uses a scalar s between 0 and 1 and simply scales the constraint updates to make a constraint soft. This parameter is quite easy to tune. 1 means infinite stiffness and 0 disables the constraint. However, this way, the effect depends on the time step size. Objects become stiffer for smaller time steps. Therefore, s is not really a physical quantity. Fortunately, this problem can be fixed in a surprisingly simple way by modifying the formula to compute lambda. The new formula is derived from explicit Euler integration. Instead of scaling the constraint, a new term alpha divided by delta t square is added to the denominator. As mentioned on the previous slide, alpha is the compliance or the inverse of physical stiffness. Since it is the inverse of physical stiffness, XPBD can also handle infinite stiffness by simply setting alpha to zero. For infinite stiffness, PBD and XPBD are identical. You can try this yourself. In my demo, I started the scene called Chain. Wait until the simulation comes to rest. I added quite a bit of damping in this scene. As you can see, the Lagrange multipliers yield the correct forces. The force equals 10 times the weight below the constraint. I chose gravity to be 10 meters per second squared to get nicer values. I set the compliance of the constraints to be 0.001 in this example. As you can see, in each link, the elongation of the constraint is 0.001 times the force acting on it. 
Change the time step size and the values remain the same. The following implementation to handle distance constraints, together with the code for integration and velocity update I showed before, make up 90% of the implementation of the entire rigid body engine. We first compute C and N. Then the inverse mass of the two bodies are computed. Next we compute lambda using the XPBD formula. Finally, the corrections are applied to the bodies. The method to compute the generalized inverse mass of a body is a direct implementation of the equation I gave in the slides. Here you see how a correction is applied to a body. This is the position update, and here you see the orientation update. On my last slide, I show you how to use a distance constraint to drag objects with the mouse. The 2D location of a mouse can be interpreted as a ray along the camera direction. If it intersects a body, I compute the intersection point of the ray with the body. I store the distance d to the intersection point. I also store the position p in the body's local frame as r. Then I create a distance constraint with zero rest length between the body and the fixed point in space located at p. On the mouse move event, I update the fixed point using the new mouse ray and the stored distance d. I also update the attachment point on the body using the current pose. On mouse up, I simply disable the constraint. This concludes the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.